Well, hello and welcome to the nation's flagship political show, Politics Today, live on Channel's television. I'm Kairo Kikulu here in Lagos. Well, today was a day of national honors, uh, which the president conferred on 449 Nigerians and those described as friends of Nigeria for their contributions to the nation's development. We had prominent Nigerians like the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed, and the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi okonjo -Wela. They were conferred with Nigeria's second highest honors, Grand Commander of the Order of the Niger, that's GCON. It's quite a long list of awardees, really, 449 of them in total. And this could well be the last of its kind in President Muhammad Buhari's administration. So take a listen. I congratulate all the recipients today who will be joining the League of Awardees. I appreciate the non-Nigerian recipients and assure all of you that this administration will continue to provide the enabling environment for you to undertake your lawful businesses to allow you to sustain your efforts at contributing to the development of our nation, Nigeria. The national honors are not merely decorative. They remind us of an important part of our responsibility as students. We must always endeavor to do our best for our country. We will continue to root out all forms of banditry, criminality, terrorism, and insurgency in the land. As I stated earlier in my independent address to the nation, I will hand over a Nigeria that is free from insecurity to the next generation of leaders. When I address President Mohamed Buhari speaking earlier today, now to some vital information for those who have registered to vote in the coming election that's in 2023. It turns out that over 2.7 million invalid registrations have been weeded out of the over 12 million new registrations conducted by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. Well, the INEC chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, says this registration pruning is necessary to sanitize the electoral registration register uh, of registration fraud and irregularities. Now, Professor Yakubu made this startling revelation while speaking in Washington, D.C., USA, at the National Endowment for Democracy Conference on Nigeria's 2023 elections, where he also said that registrants will have their permanent voter cards ready by next month, that's in November, just in time for the elections. see the opportunity of the online pre-registration during the period of one year between June 2021 and June 2022 when that option lasted and similarly the fiscal registration continued simultaneously with the online registration uh, for a period of one year including a one-month extension in response to appeal by citizens at the end of the exercise 12 million two hundred and ninety eight thousand 944 citizens completed their registration. Those who registered twice, those who are underaged, uh, or those who had no reason to register as provided by law have been weeded out. The exercise was completed a few days ago. We have not even shared the information with Nigerians, but we have 2.7 million invalid registrants. 2.7 million weeded out. We'll continue to take whatever step is necessary to protect the integrity of the register of voters because it's fundamental to the conduct of credible elections. So there you have it from the chairman of INEC, a total of 2.7 million voters weeded out as a result of irregularities and other reasons. Now, you recall that earlier in the year, INEC had announced that 1.1 million records of fresh registrants were found to be invalid and were consequently delisted. So this is bigger, 2.7 million out of a total of 12 million. Just, that just leaves about 9.3 million uh, newly registered voters valid. By the way, you can always check uh, your registration status on INEC's portal uh, just to be sure. But 
That on the one hand, there's a lot more happening in the nation's political space. So let's bring you your political roundup before we get into the meat of today's program. The presidential candidate of the new Nigerian People's Party, Rabi Musa Kwankwasu, has commissioned to campaign office in Kano State as he assures party faithful that the NNPP will defeat the ruling All Progressives Congress in the 2023 general election. He also urges them to get the permanent voter cards to qualify them as eligible voters in the election. Ocean State chapter of the All Progressives Congress, APC, has flagged off campaigns for all its candidates in the state's forthcoming local government election, billed to hold on the 15th of October 2022. The campaign, which was attended by candidates and other members of the APC across the state, took place at the State Party Secretariat in Oshobo. Speaking during the flag off, the state's party chairman, Buiga Famudun, says the election will be conducted for chairmanship, vice chairmanship, and councillorship candidates in all local government councils in the state. He urges the candidates to be civil and law-abiding as he admonishes them to be loyal and remain focused to the progressive cause of the party. It's for the councillors and the candidates and their deputies that they should remain focused with the party. They should be loyal and they should carry the flag given to them today high, as high as possible. A civil society group under the umbrella of Imo Coalition for Justice, Peace and True Democracy has called on the Imo State government to expedite actions and begin the probe of the former governor of Imo State, Emeka Ihedioha, over allegations of misappropriation of the sum of 19 billion naira during his seven-month tenure as governor. Addressing a press conference in over the Imo State capital, the group says the state government should take all necessary measures to recover the said funds, which they alleged was illegally withdrawn from the state's local government's joint accounts allocation committee, Jack, as discovered by the Auditor General for Local Government and Chieftaincy Affairs. Government's action to investigate um, the, 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 the sacked government of a making head was in line with the new IMO agenda to entrench a resilient and transparent public service and restore financial discipline and rule of law. And the governor of Edo State, Mr. Godwin Obaseki, is confident that technology will be the game changer in next year's general elections. He adds that the new electoral act will corroborate his theory. Mr. Obaseki made the claims during a PDP South South stakeholders meeting in Uyo, the Akwaibim State Capital. He insists that the Edo and Oshun governorship elections are tested testimonies to the value of technology in canvassing votes and winning elections eventually. In this zone, we have the skills, we have the knowledge to support one another in manning and running these elections. So there you go. Look at some of your political stories. But tonight on the program, we're taking on a portion of the demography of our nation that is vital to the success of any political party. You'll see them in their numbers at political rallies, party meetings. Even on election day, a lot of them get uh, to the voting points quite early, leave late. And they're always well represented at those segments, but not so in governance. Women participation in politics in Nigeria has been put at an abysmal 6%, That's according to a report by Gender Strategy Advancement International, which puts the national average of women's political participation in Nigeria at 6.7% in elective and appointive positions. Well, the ruling APC has inaugurated its women campaign team. And again, questions on women participation and representation in politics and governance. Now, that, that's beyond elections. Those questions have come up yet again and these are questions nagging for answers as we approach a new political dispensation with a look at what we achieved in the past eight years is there anything different this time around how do we learn uh, from our mistakes in the past let's start the conversation tonight with the national women leader of the ruling all progressives congress dr Beta edu joins us live from our abuja studio on politics today it's good to see you on the program uh, dr edu and quite a showing you had yesterday with women uh, of your party launching that uh, presidential campaign team for women now strictly and you know listening to your presidential candidate tell the women how much he loves them and you know telling them kind words but before now there had been issues raised about your name not being included in your party's overall presidential campaign council list in fact a group was protesting saying for a high-ranking member as yourself, surely your name should have been there. 
Okay, so I think um, it's really very simple and straight. I am Dr. Beta Edu, and I am the APC National Woman Leader, the number one woman in APC, the ruling party, the largest party in Africa. And so it would be abnormal to have my name in any list under um, other uh, 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 persons who definitely should ordinarily be under me in the party. So really my role is actually supervisory Anything that has to do with women, their mobilization, their engagement, whatever it is, I'm supposed to spearhead all of it. So this is just a support team to the main campaigns which will be unveiled soon. Remember, this is the women's presidential campaign team. It's not the council. And so all of this are all under the APC as a party. We are the vehicles, then we have passengers that drive. So people didn't have a clear understanding of different roles and how it works. So the party has its role, it has its constitution, and the role of the women leader in the constitution of the party is sacrosanct. Uh, you surely must have analyzed the list, uh, the presidential campaign council list, the main one now, uh, as you've put it now. Uh, the first. 100 names, only about three So women that has not been were, put out yet. It will right. be unveiled on the unveiling. Okay, so the one we have, which, I mean, is the official one right now, uh, pending when your party perhaps puts up an update. First 100 names, just about three women. Second 100 names, just about five women. And that's about, what, 5% representation on that list uh, that was brought out earlier. On. And it raised questions about, you know, the leadership of your party, which you are. Uh, a member of being really involved in the coming up of that list. One expected that at least the affirmative action will be evident in that list released by your party. So I'll, I'll make this explanation really very clear, right? The party has the main presidential campaign council, which would be released and properly unveiled with all of its members where you find loads of women on that list. However, the party wants to give prominence or has given prominence to the role that women play in the electioneering process. And that's why they created a separate support team that will accommodate more than a thousand. In fact, we have over a thousand five hundred women on that support team right now. So really, you need to understand that the Women Campaign Council, well, sorry, the Women Campaign, Presidential Campaign team is where we have accommodated all the women, key stakeholders, strong women in our party, and we have issued roles to them to go all out and campaign. The main PCC does not have a women's directorate asset now, except there are any last minute changes that might happen, but it doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. And if you look through the list of the PCC, even though over 1,500 women have been accommodated on the team, you still have loads of women on the main PCC, but they are not going to be dealing directly directly with women mobilization, but with other areas uh, such as grassroots mobilization, strategic planning, um, uh, the legal aspect of the whole campaign, the ICT aspect, intelligence, security, logistics, name it. Those are the aspects where uh, those who have their names come out on the main PCC would really be dealing with. Well, Dr. Edu, time and again, women, including yourself, you've clamored for a seat at the table. And you've been clear about the nomenclature of this, uh, you know, this organization, saying it's a team, not even the council. You've made that clarification. So haven't clamored for, I mean, seat at the table, affirmative action, 35%. Uh, would you say that this PCC list that will eventually be, be released as a final list would at least live up to the expectation of including 35% of women, as they say, charity begins at home. I am very, very positive. In fact, tomorrow there is a joint meeting at the 
APC secretariat between the NWC of the ruling party and the governors and representatives from the presidential campaign council for us to look at all the issues concerning the list, unify the list, ensure that we have proper inclusion and representation of women, of youth, and even of the disabled. Remember, this is the largest party in Africa, and we have a lot of people eager to be on that list, to contribute their own quota in the election of the next president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So we must find a way as a party, as a group, to ensure that all this interest is protected. And I'm very, very positive. I'm very sure that after the meeting tomorrow, women will have more than 35% representation in the entire list. Uh, but Dr. Edu, they always say you can judge what a person will do by what the person has done. And I mean, looking at uh, even the ministerial cabinet of the president, you see just about 14, 15 percent of women representation. Now, that's your party over the past eight years. That's the best your party has been able to do. But you are confident now that you will even do more than 35 percent. On what basis can we place that trust, having seen how your party carried itself, even within the presidency itself? Okay, so I'll say this as a, as a very great and strong party. Every single day we continue to improve on whatever we've done in time past. In fact, if you have watched the trajectory, uh, you will notice that in the last convention of the party, a lot of amendments were done to the constitution of the party. Before this time out, we never used to have two uh, women in the NWC, that's the National Working Committee of the party. But that convention brought in the deputy national woman leader as a member of the NWC. Before this time out, we never used to have it compulsory that at the local government, at the state level, we must have two women out of the five delegates that are at the state level. And then for the national delegate, you should have one out of the three persons at the national delegate being a woman. These are things that we have made compulsory in our party just to ensure that women are included and they are part of the electionary process. And we build that interest, that commitment, that engagement with women. Of course, going through the electionary process, uh, before this time, we used to know that women buy the same forms, the way men buy the forms. For the first time in the party, we're able to say, look, let women have the forms free of charge so mm. we can have more women participate. And it showed off uh, with the results results that we have on the ground. Because before now, we used to have about 30-something uh, candidates from our party as women. But right now, we have close to 95 female candidates running on the ticket of APC. And more importantly, we even have a female who is running for the position of a governor of a state. No other party in the 2023 election has that feat that APC has been able to achieve. This is the prominence that the party right. is giving to women. And of course, we're dealing with a candidate, Asiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinibu, one who has been tested and trusted. And he's not dealing with promises. I will. I will. We're dealing with evidence, raw, crude evidence. He well, went, uh, it Dr. Edu, so fashionable to pardon me to come in there. Just at that point you Nigeria made. Nigeria because definitely everyone would think ah, a woman, you probably will not win that election. He was able right. to bring a woman on. At, at that point you made, so it, it's a bit tricky. So you're making promises this time around based on the candidate of your party for the 2023 elections. But we've heard these promises in times past, in 2015, pre-2015, 2019. Some of them included uh, the affirmative action, even the national gender policy saying that, you know, we'll have something. And don't forget that just a few months ago, we saw what played out in the National Assembly with your party's majority with those gender bills. So imagine Nigerians listening to you now, making those promises, and then remembering that those promises were made pre-2015, about eight years down the line. So are you saying that Nigerians should separate these new promises from the old one? Perhaps old things are passed away, all things have become so new? So we're not yet done. Hold your breath. We're not yet done with... We're not yet done, right? We're not yet done with the administration of President Muhammadu Buhari, which is an APC government. Yesterday at the villa, in the speech of the president when he was inaugurating, 
this um, uh, pres women presidential uh, campaign team, he was very clear. He said the office of the Minister for Women Affairs should work with the Attorney General and, of course, the office of the wife of the president to ensure that before he leaves as president, we pass legislations that protects and mainstreams women. Even when the wife of the president came to give her speech, she said we'll have a pact, a pact that will ensure that as Nigerian women go out to work for a candidate to be delivered, they will be rewarded. But of course, beyond this, it's not just only about positioning at uh, the national ministerial appointment. There's several agencies, MDAs, that are headed by women. And when you come to the grassroots, what is government doing to empower women? These are part of the questions which we should be asking. There are many social intervention programs, and they are targeted at women. If you have followed um, the uh, human Humanitarian Affairs Ministry, where they have the unconditional cash transfer and a lot of interventions at the grassroots, 70% of this is targeted at women. So really, the government in many ways have been deliberate about empowering women even beyond positioning. And of course, you can see that the party has improved its number of women on elective tickets in the party. So like I said, it's a work in progress. And we are very hopeful that before president leaves, we'll have legislation to protect women. And when the new president comes in by the grace of God, we will have more women from the Federal Executive Council to heading MDAs to the very least grassroots empowerment in our villages. More women will benefit from government. Oh, when you say you have more legislations to protect women, which... Uh, which legislation are you referring to in particular? Is it the uh, gender equality bill? Are you talking about the other five gender bills? Which ones are you talking about? Because what this administration has barely how many months to leave? And uh, don't forget, those gender bills have not even been mentioned uh, again in spite of the promises made. So which bills in particular should Nigerians expect before this government runs out? So I think uh, this out? was the charge from yesterday from yesterday's meeting and we're looking at the 35 percent affirmative action we're equally looking at the other gender bills that were taken to the national assembly but did not scale through the first time the president has instructed that all of this should be looked into remember before now we already had the buy-in of even the uh, speaker of the house of reps who expressly uh, addressed the women and said that this would be reviewed again and brought back to the floor of the house. We still have some time and we believe that with the president personally interested in this, as well as other key Nigerians and indeed the international community, will fast track the action, of course, to achieve all of these bills that will mainstream women and give us our rightful place in governance, in politics. I, I do hope I'm not being unfair here if I maybe ask you to talk about the past seven years, saying that you just joined the party uh, in 2021. But, I mean, I'll still take it on since you're the uh, national women leader of the party. Over the past seven years or thereabouts, uh, would you say that this administration of your party has done well by women? And I mentioned those promises made which, I mean, your party failed at, but Besides that, would you say, look to women listening to you right now in Nigeria and say, our party has done right by you? Yes, I can boldly say that our party, APC, has done well by the Nigerian woman. I think we need to take the um, narrative a little away from just uh, about um, offering you a seat at the Federal Executive Council and um, things around um, heading of the MDAs. We've got good representation there, and like I said, we can make it better. But there are issues that affect women on a day-to-day -day basis.
There are issues that affect women. Financial empowerment is one of it. One of the reasons why we have high maternal mortality rates, which is beginning to drop, is the fact that women are unable to make decisions when they should make those decisions because they are not financially empowered. Women have other problems. They wake up in the morning, a mother is unable to feed the child, to go to school and participate in school. And she's worried, how can I get that done? The government has found several ways, several ways to do right by women. If as a mother, you send your child to do school and you're positive, you're sure that your child in school would be fed, at least you're sure that that meal will be given to the child. It gives you hope, it gives you peace as a mother. I spoke about the conditional cash transfers. At least I was part of the team that went to Cross River State and within the last 18 months, they had reached out to over 36,000 women in Cross River State and these women were coming out live to give testimonies. They were collecting the money and of course even during the COVID era we had a lot of interventions, survival funds and cares and uh, of course you don't want to even leave mentioning the farmers, female farmers that were prioritized when they said support farmers, rice farmers, in my state, I have good example. Number of women who I knew before this time did not have funds to farm, but today they can boldly show you their farms and what they've made out of it. All of these are ways in which the Nigerian government was mm. keeping a social contract with the Nigerian people, right? And of course, remember that we had a pandemic that we had right. to deal with as a government. So when you look at it, you look at it vis-a-vis -vis all the other the issues that shut down our nation for several months and other global issues that affected Nigeria and several other countries. But I can boldly look Nigerian women into the eyes to say, yes, indeed, there were interventions, social and otherwise, that prioritized Nigerian women. But remember, help, hope, more and more improvement is right. coming. Well, uh, President Buhari, as you referenced yesterday, admitted to the fact that there's a lot that needs to be done. As you said, he instructed the AGF, Minister of Women Affairs, even uh, the, the wife of the president, to come up with possible constitutional and legal changes that will essentially help create a level playing field for women in politics and government. And it takes me back to the point of getting a seat at the table. At this point, it's just about 15% of the president's ministerial cabinet. And uh, I imagine that you have spoken to members of your party, even lawmakers who are meant to at least vote for that or those bills, and even lawmakers within your party didn't vote for it. So I wonder, what are those barriers? Perhaps this can form part of the policy changes that you are proffering. Okay, so I'll give you the barriers from both sides, right? As women, we have things which have been uh, barriers over time. So ideologies where women just believe that I should not be involved in politics. Um, politics is for a man. Uh, politics is not my, my thing. Their own ideologies. Of course, we have the religious constraints uh, where it's said that all oh, women should not be heard. Um, women should be submissive and the rest of it. And then people build rhetorics around it to use to push women to the back burner. Of course, we have issues around funding, which is a major problem, a major, major problem, except you empower that woman. She's unable to make decisions. She's unable to take steps to really get into the political space and speak up for herself. Remember, it's not easy to run elections anywhere in the world. Of course, Nigeria is not an exception. We have issues uh, um, around stereotyping. We have issues around corruption, uh, which has not made it easy for women to thrive in the political space, where you have one woman making an error or failing in a place, and then you suddenly just think, yes, because one woman failed, then it shuts the door for 60,000 or 60 million other women out there. You see it a lot when people are driving. If someone drives in a funny way, the next thing you hear is, I'm sure it's a, why is he driving like a woman? Or I'm sure it's the woman who is driving that car. All of those stereotyping are things which have pulled women back from participating. They believe it's a dirty game. We don't want to get involved. Women who are involved are not cultured or they're not morally um, correct. They're too exposed and 
and that's not what our culture preaches. Those are things that have held women back. But in addition to this, there is that mental belief uh, amongst the male folks too that it's a competition instead of a complementary process of building our nation. And so these are things which we continue to give orientation to our men and women. If you listened recently in the news and all across for, um, going through the Office of the Women Affairs, even the United Nations, you hear things like he for she, trying to bring men into the awareness that it's not a competition for space. It's just saying that we have to work together harmoniously to build our country, to build our nation. And truly, if you want this nation to develop at the speed of light, we, everyone, needs to be very conscious of getting women into leadership positions and giving right. us a seat on the table. So these are things that have held us back from both angles. And we're mm. beginning to see some men stand up to say, yes, let women actually have uh, this seat at the table. Let them be mainstreamed. We are really very positive. Remember, it's a critical period for even the people at the legislation. Right. They want the votes from the women right now. So well, if that deal do. goes back to the House, I'm really very sure at this point that they would do all they can to ensure that it's quickly passed and women are mainstream. I think this is a good window of opportunity for the Nigerian woman. Right. Uh, just a few months to point out uh, a few months that your party has in power, President Muhammad Buhari. So it will be important to see how much work can be done so people can uh, indeed hold you by your promise. But uh, a few more issues to raise uh, before we wrap up the conversation. I mean, you also represent a demography of young people, uh, as it were, not just women, young people. And I recall that you were vocal. Uh, during the NSARS movement, you were vocal with other young people calling for a change, even with your governor uh, at that time, who was in the PDP. And a lot of them now are tilting towards the obedient movement, saying that they want something different from APC and the PDP. Some of them saying, enough is enough. We've had eight years of, of one, we've had another uh, eight years of another. And they're saying, they want a change, as it were. I wonder how uh, you relate with those young people, especially some of them who see you as betraying the whole movement. How, how do you reconcile all of that? Sir, I think I need to get this very, very clear, right? My state was terribly affected by the NSARS. And even on channels television, we stood all out, myself, my governor, to speak against that movement which was hijacked by hoodlums and would destroy development for 30 years. Things that we would not even as a state be able to recover in the next 20 to 30 years. It was not a child's play. It took development of my state some steps back, but for the fact that we had a very strong hand as a governor who was able to galvanize support and really galvanize really, in fact, everyone's mind in the state to hold on and just walk towards rebuilding. It was a very, very terrible time for us as a state and for Nigeria as a country. And at no time did we ever agree or at no time did we ever say that Nigerian young people should not dialogue, but they should go into the streets to destroy what they have used, their taxpayers' money and their hard-earned money to build. Now coming to the point of myself being a young person, I think my party made a very strong statement by giving the leadership of the women's wing to a young person. Right. For the first time probably in history of the electionary process of my party. I'm the first woman leader elected into the party at 35 years of age, right? And this was done to say, we believe in young people. We want to harness the innovation. We want to harness the energy. We want to harness all the productivity you bring to the table well, Dr. for Edu, nation building, for we, building a political We need party, to wind down uh, because of, of our time. And that's what my party did. And for the young people who I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, I encourage them. Right. right. We need to support the party and support okay. our presidential candidates. Well, in less than 30 seconds. So 
you may have seen the economists uh you know uh, the, the report that was done describing peter Albee as possibly the winner of the next elections and also said that he's been revolutionary and i wonder if you agree don't forget that he was a uh, former running mate in your former party so this is someone you know as well do you agree with that Doctor, I do, I'm not sure if you got that question. I beg your pardon. I question. Um, we lost the sound from here, so oh dear. you might need to take that again. Okay, we're, we're actually we're, we're closing, but let's see if I can squeeze in that in less than 30 seconds. The Economist described Peter B. as revolutionary. In fact, said he might be the next president of Nigeria. You know him well within your former party, and I wonder if you agree with that projection. Okay, uh, we might have to take this another time. Uh, that's, that's our time on the program, at least for this conversation. We'd like to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Beta Edu, who is uh, the National Women Leader uh, of the Ruling All Progressives Congress. Thank you so much for your time. I guess we'll continue this another time. Thank you so much for having me. All right, well, we'll take a moment now on the program. And when we return, the PDP is confident that it can pull Nigerians uh, out of poverty, out of hunger. And there are issues that are still deep within the party. And what you see in the news, we'll be having an insider and a prominent member of the party joining us tonight. As you've seen, Elijah Mukhtar Shagari is our next guest. Hey, welcome back to the nation's flagship political show. Well, let's turn our attention to the opposition PDP. Well, yesterday we had a prominent member uh, from one of the states whose governor was absent at that flag of, of the presidential rally in Akwaibom. And today we're joined by a prominent member who was at the rally and whose governor has played a key role in the build-up to this day. We're now in the arena of the People's Democratic Party tonight. We're joined by Alhaji Mukhtar Shagari, who's a former deputy governor uh, of Sokoto State, is also a very key and prominent member of the PDP. Thank you for joining us on the program, Alhaji. Shigari. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Well, it, it was quite a showing for your party yesterday in Akwaibom State. Uh, and it's interesting I'm saying your party today because uh, five months ago on May the 25th, you dumped the PDP. Uh, and I'm just wondering, what changed? <laughs> well, um, I think, first of all, let's talk about the most important issue. The most important issue uh, is simply the outing of the PDP yesterday. Um, I'm happy that you yourself, you have judged that outing as one of the best. Well, Alad Shagari, we'll get to that definitely, but it's the yesterday. elephant in the room, and it's important to address that, because a lot of people are still Management. wondering, oh, you're back in the PDP, haven't seen that statement. So it's important to situate it for our viewers. What changed? Why are you back well, in okay, the PDP? Let's, 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 let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. That's, let's talk about that. That's true. I made, a, I made a statement, and I said, I'm leaving PDP. But leaving a party has a process. I only made a statement, and after that, the leaders of the party decided to set up a committee, and the committee met me at home, and we discussed the issues. And I agreed with them, because when you are wronged, and your leaders come to you and say, look, we understand that you are wronged, but we really want you to forget and forgive. If you are a responsible person, you should forget and forgive. So that has gone, and I'm in my party. I did not leave the party. I only made a statement. I'm in PDP, and we are preparing and gearing up to take over the government in this country in 2023. So, so for those you... who say that is on the party, I think they are wrong. I know right, attempts so... have been made by the opposition party to lure me into, the, into their party. But no, I've been in PDP since 1998. Right. I, I, I actually was a minister twice in PDP. I was deputy governor for eight years. I'm a very respected member of the party and I have principles. And part of my principles is not to jump around from one party to another. And right. I decided to stay in my party. So and here we you're are. saying, in essence, that you are fully... 
PDP now never to dump the party again? Because in that statement you put out, uh, Alad Jagari, this country to prosperity. Right. If you can hear me, so you're saying essentially you are in PDP never to leave again, as you said sure. in that statement that sure. uh, you had seized from today. Those were your words in the statement uh, from being a member of the PDP, just to see to it that is important. But now to the internal issues in your party. And um, yes, I talked about that rally, I mean, the, the flag off. It turns out that within your party, from the conversations we've been having with, you know, people who are familiar with the internal workings, there are those who support the candidates uh, of um, Elijah Atikwa Bubakar, his running mate, but not the party's leadership, especially with the handling uh, of some of these uh, issues. And I wonder, what is your position on that? Are you one of those who support the party, full-hearted, and even the candidate? Or you, you're wondering, why is the national uh, leadership handling issues like this? Well, uh, uh, number one, I am a loyal party member of the PDP and I've always been loyal to this party. Don't forget, in 2007 when I contested the governorship of Sokolese, I won the primary with 80% of the votes. A stranger was brought into the party, was given my ticket and because of my loyalty to the party, I accepted that. So I'm a loyal member of the party. My party has a candidate in whom I believe, with whom I worked for six years and seven months as minister twice. I know who he is, very competent, nationalistic, patriotic, a man who feels Nigerians must be protected, a man who has the experience to do it. And by the way, he's the only candidate in this country that has been a vice president of this country twice for eight years. So if you're talking about experience and the rest of it, you cannot beat Atiku. I think it's miles and miles ahead of any candidate we have in this country today. But the issue is this, our party has a candidate. There are some problems here and there. We are not a party that will go to the marketplace and discuss our problems. The problems are being addressed and solutions will be found and we will go out there and we will, and we will do everything possible to win the 2023 general election. So if you want me to discuss that matter, I'm not going to discuss the internal affairs of my party on television. We will discuss them. We have mechanisms on how best we can, we can resolve our problems and so on and so forth. It's just like in your house. You have a problem with your family or your wife. Do you go to the market and start telling everybody? No. We well, are making Shagari. effort and this problem that we have will be resolved. Well, my family is not uh, pushing up a candidate to run in the 2023 election. We don't have a flag bearer, as it were. <laughs> We're not registered as a political party. But I asked that question because internal party affairs, yes, but it's out there. I mean, people have access to at least majority of what's going on within your party. They've heard party leaders speak their minds. Some of them, they just bear their minds as to what they think is happening, how they think things, to, things should be done. Which is why I ask uh, how your party leadership is handling this as a whole. Because you had previously said uh, in that statement, I mean, you, you, you didn't mince words. You said that your party is one party, in your words, that deceitfully claims to be a bastion of democracy, but has instead become a party of the highest bidder. And, and you, you said quite some things. So it looks like this is, might be a reflection of those issues you had faced for you to have released that statement. Uh, just to be clear, can you hear me, uh, Lahad Shagari? Yes, I, I can hear you now. I can okay, hear you now. I'm not sure at what point you lost me, but uh, at the risk of sounding like a broken record. I'll just take the part where I asked uh, about your party's handling of the issues. On the back of what you had said earlier, describing your party as a party that deceitfully claims to be a bastion of democracy, but has instead become a party of the highest bidder. Those were your words uh, when you uh, said you were leaving the party. And it would seem as though that is a reflection of those issues you faced then. Well, the... Well, the, uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that, yes, there was a problem in the party. We have addressed those problems. What was done to me personally has been properly addressed. I'm satisfied, and I love my party, and I'm in my party. And I have said that, yes, we are not saying that we don't have problems in the PDP, but we have mechanisms of solving our problems. That is why we are PDP.
And that is why we are, that is why we are the PDP that is acceptable to all Nigerians. And that is why today Nigerians are saying that they are lamenting the fact that they did not vote PDP in 2015 and repeated the mistake in 2019. In 2023, the Nigerian people have already made up their minds. They know the party that cares about them. They know the party that has the capacity to run Nigeria. They know the party that has the capacity to run the economy of this country. They know the party that has the capacity to protect them and give them security. They know the party that can fight poverty. And they right. know the party that was able to manage the debt of this country to the extent that Nigeria was not owing a single kobo. You know very well as much as I do, as much as everybody does, how much we are owing today. You know, so the issue is PDP, we are not saying we don't have problem, but we have mechanisms that we use to solve our problems. And that is what we are really doing. The fact of the matter is that the opposition will want us to continue quarreling. We are no longer quarreling. People have some problems and they have made their problems very clear. And there are mechanisms and there are ways and means that we are using now to ensure that every problem that we have in our party is addressed. We are not going to allow anybody. We are not going to allow any party. We are not going to allow any candidate. We are not going to allow any support of any party to derail us from the objective that we have set ourselves, liberating the people of this country from poverty, from insecurity, you know, from hunger, from lack of infrastructure, and from so many maladies that are actually uh, bedeviling this country today. So the right. issue is Nigerians have tested APC, Nigerians also have tested the PDP, and mm. now they know the difference. The difference, like Sprite, is very clear, and Atiku is the answer. Well, you are, uh, you've been a prominent politician in Sokoto from the very beginning, uh, as you said, holding key positions. So you are privy to the internal workings. And uh, I mean, still on Sokoto, your governor has been quite prominent uh, in the build up to this moment we're at uh, within your party. And part of Governor Wiki's grouse, who is someone, uh, one of the people who have spoken up time and again about the issues they have within your party. A part of his grouse is the way the chairman uh, commended Governor Tambuwal for stepping down for the presidential candidates, the now presidential candidate of your party after the primaries. And for Governor Wiki, that was a show of bias, something not expected of the national chairman uh, of your party. I, I know you are aware of that, and perhaps, do you see it in a different light? Well, you see, the fact of the matter is this. Wike is a very important member of the People's Democratic Party, and he's still a member of the party. He has not told anybody that he's leaving the party. He has some issues, and the issues are very well known. And I have said to you from the beginning, I'm not going to discuss on television the internal problems and issues of my party, since the party is making effort to address all those problems. And don't forget, Tambuel and Wiki are very good and very close friends. And their relationships and friendship is so strong that nothing of this sort will actually set them apart. And I believe that nothing will make Wiki leave the PDP. He has said the problems he has with the party, and those issues have been addressed. And I believe at the end of the day, all the issues will be resolved, and we will go to the field, and by the grace of God, Atiku Abubakar, the next president of Nigeria. Well, the question really is, can there be a different interpretation to that act uh, by the national chairman to Governor Tambuwal, I mean, commending him for that move? Is it wrong to think, Wait a minute, that is biased. That should not be coming from a national chairman, especially after such an event, or perhaps it was a misinterpretation of what exactly happened. That's the question. Well, I don't speak for the national chairman. I'm not his spokesperson. And I don't want to come and radio, uh, and I don't want to come and television and start saying whether the national chairman is wrong or right. If I have an advice to give him, and I have a decision that I made in my mind about him. He is a friend of mine. He was my cabinet colleague. I can go to his house and tell him, not on television. Right. As we wind down now, uh, I mean, fair enough. The former vice presidential candidate of your party, 
is now seen as a dark horse in this race, with polls putting him way ahead of even your party and your candidate. The Economist recently uh, boosted his chances, saying he's revolutionary, might even become the next president. So, with the benefit of hindsight, let's wind down on this. Do you think maybe your party should have, you know, zoned this to the south, seeing the amount of support is gathering, the momentum from young people, and even polls? With the benefit of hindsight, do you think that may have been uh, the, the right choice to make? Well, sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, it's, it's okay. My question is on, uh, well, the chances of a former member of your party, was a former vice presidential candidate, uh, Mr. Peter Obi. There's been this editorial that came out of The Economist, you know, putting him way ahead, after we've seen Paul was also putting him ahead. And I wonder, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, do you think your party should maybe have zoned this to the south, such that you could have, you know, reading on the support he's getting now? Oh dear, uh, looks like uh, the question is not just getting through. Uh, maybe I shall try this one well, more time. Uh, well, Elijah well, Shagari, uh, can you hear me? First of all, since you have uh, brought the issue of Obi here, then now let me tell you this, and for Nigerians also to know, I was one of the first people, Labour leader, sorry, uh, what if a Labour Party contacted if I would accept to be the vice presidential candidate of Peter Obi. But at the end of the day, I told them that I would not be able to leave my party because I believe in the philosophy of my party. I believe in what my party stands for Nigeria. And I also believe that the Labour Party will not be able to beat my party at any election. What is happening? So many young people, as you said, who are those young people? I asked the Liberal Party members that contacted me to tell me who really is the chairman of the Liberal Party in Sokoto State. Who are the candidates of the Liberal Party in Sokoto State? Who is contesting for Senate? Who is contesting for governorship and so on and so forth? I did not get any satisfactory answer. The issue is at any point in time, people will say, oh, okay, look, this party, this man has come with so many lofty ideas and the rest of it and so on and right. so forth. Nigerians are not looking for lofty ideas. Nigerians are looking for solutions of the problems or the melodies of this country right. in the area of economy, in the area of security, in the area of infrastructure, in the area of infrastructure, in the area of poverty elevation. In well, Elijah Shagari, in we have to Don't run forget, now. Don't forget, thousands um, of doctors... And we we have to run now. Uh, having to repeat that question really adds into our the time. Poverty in this I apologize. I'll have to uh, come in right now. If you can hear me, Elijah Shagari. is at its highest level. Well, I'm this sorry, we have to wrap up uh, because of our time, but really I'd like to thank These you so much, uh, Alhaji Mukhtar Shagari, uh, who joined us live from our Abuja studio. He's a former uh, deputy governor of uh, Sokoto State. He's been speaking to us about the internal affairs of the PDP. I wish we had more time, as always, but we have to run. We'll be back tomorrow with the latest uh, topics, latest issues in the political space. Until then, I'm Kaido Kikyo. Have a wonderful night. Yeah.